even though I am not a paid actor, <laughs> and I'm getting no remuneration of any sort for saying this, <clears throat> using my own patented methods, although I have not been able to quit smoking, <laughs> I have bought three new apartment buildings, <laughs> and, I, and I've lost over 2,000 pounds. <laughs> How Life Works, Part 70. <laughs> One man never watches television, and to fill his idle time, he writes articles explaining why he doesn't watch television. <laughs> A legend. In the beginning, everyone wants to figure out what life is all about. But then, most get distracted and never think about it again until they're about to die. Then they think, ah, shit. Either that or, oh, God. <laughs> the heretofore unverbalized credo of civilized man. Everything's broke. Fix it. <laughs> <laughs> the simple of mind likes symbols to represent things, while the more sophisticated prefer verbal descriptions of same. And further on past all of that are the more alert who want their things plain. Just... Things as things. It is believed that the mystical tradition has hidden itself in such areas as religion, philosophy, music, politics, and even the art of war. But why does no one suspect that they, in fact, may have hidden themselves in the mystical? The interesting aspect of a rubber band on Jupiter is that it can't be turned inside out. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Klein. <clears throat> Wherever gravity goes, there also goes man. Well, sure, it's easy to be polite to a man holding a gun. <clears throat> when you think too specifically, you perceive all twos to be composed of ones and ones. Dichotomous categories, mutually exclusive and exhaustive even in areas having nothing to do with mathematics. Question, will certain uses of the mind alone produce increased awareness? No, but certain routine uses will certainly guarantee not. How are you going to keep them down on the farm once they realize that there's not only a farm, but also an anti-farm, and that both of them put together produces a whole new urban neural landscape? One guy got so hip and ahead of the game that he even quit reading what he had written. <laughs> the difference between man and the other creatures on this planet. Life put the other creatures here and told them, go kick ass. Then dropped man in the mix and told him, go kick ass, but get their names. <laughs> In all ordinary oaths of determination resides a tacit addendum that says, I do, however, reserve the right to weaken in my stated resolve. <laughs> Only a true warrior calls a spade an irreversible one and tells it never to call him. <laughs> Even using my own method, see, I couldn't quit smoking. But I did, I did acquire two new apartment houses for very little down and lost over 2,000 pounds. Can you believe there's still people that don't understand all this is co <coughs> co <coughs> connected? To, dis to dispute another man's script is to, in part, embrace it. One man who had his own TV show ceased receiving letters from viewers. In case you'd like to figure out where a TV show might actually originate, not all of them are inside a Munch box. The place, planet Earth. The subject, the wisdom of age. 
As hormones begin to wear down, neurons will start to say, hey, we're tired of these guys pushing us around. <laughs> Tis only the old and synthetic mystics, who are worse than chronologically old, who will say that man should despise the flesh. <laughs> the future is filled with promise, the past with regret. An ordinary mind is a simple mind, and a simple mind is a one-way mind. I know it seems otherwise, but it's just a one-way mind with a mirror. <laughs> On one planet, to keep the creatures properly distracted, life sent a guy to talk to those most likely to ever cause a disturbance and had him turn their attention to neural matters rather than hormonal ones. And see, it worked out real neat because to them that certainly seemed like the terminology regarding progress. Psst. And P.S. Nobody but the real thing mystic would dare or could bear to seriously consider and think on this possibility. Okay, fair is fair. And let's give every dupe his day. A simple mind can be a happy mind, just so long as it doesn't try to jump up and down or go anywhere. Yeah. So there. How life works. Technical subsection D. Just as gasoline powers the entire automobile from the mechanical running gear to the electrical system and everything in between, so also is man driven by fossil fuels. <laughs> Everyone starts out seeing things as things. But after they begin to speak, the symbols of words become part of the things they represent. And in some instances, actually replace the things themselves. But as per the mystical tradition, D-I-A-F-S-S-H-B-D, there is a familiar sounding spot, however, beyond that. The only people qualified to do predictions are those who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> The imperative twin S's of man. For the body, survival. For the mind, seriousness. Mm -hmm. And since the latter is fueled by the former, whose survival at any cost is of paramount importance, you can easily see why it is inclined to adopt a similar stance in its domain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Letters to the editor. If there was a God, like in how the religious believe, then everybody's on a mission therefrom. <laughs> and one demand demanded, is this any way to run a railroad only to later realize it was in fact an airport? <laughs> Life takes some out of the mystical game by having them swell up and explode. <laughs> Those who can't run like to bring back the reports of running. <laughs> how things are compared with, let us say, how things are. In a three-dimensional reality, once you have vision, it would seem that you should be able to either expand it or restrict it. Only problem is, there sure, it sure seems hard to figure out how to expand it. As regards thinking the unthinkable, consider how topsy-turvy things can apparently get between an ordinary view of something and that of a more active mind when it is put into words, for example. With a normal civilized man, it is unquestionably preferable for him to argue than to murder, while with one attempting the mystical, it would be in fact better for him to slay someone than to argue with him in the full transcendental sense. Every word is its own private universe and reality. Every word is its own private universe and reality, and while they can at times overlap with the things they represent, 
it is by no means certain. <laughs> the ethical philosophy of warfare. It is the defeated who allege that it rains on the just and unjust alike. <laughs> Query. <laughs> Query. The instant applicable regarding one's own neural precipitation. One got up and had this thought. Why wouldn't someone who knew more be courteous and considerate? What the hell would he care anyway? <laughs> One consideration of how it might seem that life should work. People should be delighted to see someone attempting to do something extraordinary. <laughs> how it might seem that life should work. <laughs> Subtitle, D-Y-C-I, don't you count on it, C-O-I. <laughs> One man decided that the first thing he would think of every morning when he awoke was that he was now awake. No. Two ways of looking at it. When men moved from taking the mythical for the literal, they went from childhood to adulthood or from childhood to super childhood. <laughs> Every parade needs clowns. Yeah, but this many? <laughs> <laughs> As regards matters of non-physical health, no one can make you sick unless you let them. Life can make anybody sick anytime it wants to. Being alive is the losing battle in which everyone wins. Inter intergalactic mental myth time. A brand new guy arrived on this one world and for a price agreed to do all of the thinking for the native creatures. And they agreed to pay him a buck sixty-five for his trouble. <laughs> Being conscious beyond the realm of mere thinking is the form of space travel. <laughs> How genes work in the real world. A neat man is a happy man. Unless he was miserable to begin with. <laughs> How things work. Sleep, food, and sex works. But nothing else. A real circus would be where they shoot clowns out of a cannon. Nay, Jose, it would be where cannons are shot out of clowns. Yeah. Time is a metaphor and space symbolism. This leaves man as a dot over an eye in some unknown sentence. One method by which the mind has been able to sustain its lofty position is, is, in, is by convincing the stomach of its superiority. <clears throat> Until things are named, they aren't relative to one another, just connected. <laughs> Defined anew, the mystical trip. How to lose your mind without going insane. Update, the relationship between how weak you are and how serious you are continues to exist. Reminder, if you forget about being a mystic, you'll forget to be a mystic. Hey, said life, who loves you, babe? <laughs> the chain, fleas have fleas, and their fleas have fleas, but only man has a mind. <laughs> with fleas <laughs> one man told life save your sympathy for someone else and life replied but you are all of my someone else's Aww. fake mystics find it hard to live in the real world okay. only idiots take life and I might add other idiots seriously I think your action speaks for itself. 
That was either no offense or lots of offense. According to how seriously you took it. One guy, one motto. Never like anyone who's popular. It didn't say it, but I feel I should warn you that don't think that has anything to do with your neural activities. <laughs> nah. Yeah. And plus, don't go in the bathroom mirror and look up at your head and see if you see the cover of People magazine. <laughs> Another fairy tale regarding what it's possible for someone to think. One man thought. If a mystic could have some public collective role to play, what could it be other than to make people feel better? <laughs> and now, another legend of the sea. A primary responsibility of any captain worthy of the title is to, no matter the circumstances, always reassure the passengers. <laughs> Yet, then again, one man thought, captains are drafted, not volunteers. <laughs> And what would you make of that? What new element would that add to the already salty, mystical stew? Doctrine that no one verbally professes to live by. Never try to help anyone unless it helps you. When the great snake originally consumed the whole universe, it burped on everyone's behalf. <laughs> One description of the area around the mystical festival might make note of such specifics as a more active mind and a calmer consciousness. Once you see how everything's connected, then you can disconnect them if you want to. Everyone's main job is to be themselves. And to complain about others doing likewise. <laughs> Life makes everyone say that they want to see Shangri-La. But men sense that it, what it actually is and thus don't really want to. That is all except for mystics. What a real bunch of guys. Get out of here you big lugs. <laughs> <clears throat> Since everyone always requests, that is, no one ever requests, uh, there was one in there somewhere tonight, and there was one in there somewhere the other night, and there's been several before. <laughs> That, in various ways, points out that those who believe they're interested in, let's just call it, uh, things mythical, mystical, transcendental, all that sort of thing. We're still talking about the sane. We're not talking about the synthetic, drugstore, professional, serious mystics and weirdos. Which right there, you understand, chokes most people's ordinary mind to say that there is because an ordinary person normally says, well, anybody that is interested in that is de facto weird. And then for somebody to come along and be doubly weird to say, wait a minute, there are two forms. There's the weird kind and then the non-weird kind. Mm -hmm. Then you have almost perforce placed yourself in a brand new, probably singular category in their mind of weirdness. Yeah. <clears throat> but we that is at bay. Uh, as for the several legends that we've heard here, everyone had the original interest in such as this. You're born with it. You made no mistake losing it. Uh, you were, in fact, supposed to lose it. And, in fact, men afterwards, life has made them write fairy tales and myths to help explain it. They show up and religious literature, and they show up in mundane tales and legends. But having to do with the loss of innocence, that makes it sound better. That term's been around for years, that in some way you outgrow your childishness, and you have to face up to life. 
to wit, you know, get married, get a mortgage, get fat, get pissed, <laughs> that sort of thing. Be normal, be middle class. But it is, even poetically, sort of, ah, hard, ah, on the basis that, ah, it's nice to be a kid and do kiddish things, but then we can't stay kids all of our life. And that, with most people, about explains it away, at least poetically. That if nothing else, they can say that to themselves or they can run across some sort of literary poetic description along those lines. You go, know, that's true. And yet the fact is, that which is passed off as innocence, that which is passed off as childish things, indeed by the civilized, by the majority rule in which life dictates that the main parade travel by, mm -hmm. it is excused, it is passed off, and thus in a sense people rationalize the fact that, well, here I am, I am grown, and life is not as much fun. You almost do not remember that. And people almost do not like to hear it brought up. But then when they do, there's already been enough ammunition fueled into their own mind that they can say, well, I couldn't have stayed a kid. <laughs> and they think back, if they did, in the manner in which memory normally serves the ordinary mind, they think back to childishness per se as being a physical time and space, that childish things were simply not having a job, doing what you wanted to, playing all day. And that's not really the childishness. That is not what the, quote, loss of innocence, the necessary loss of innocence excuse is actually covering. What you miss is the original that you look life dead in the eye. Now, for those of you that like it more exact, life and you looked each other dead in the eye as per its desire. And you blinked. Or the one that says that originally everyone knew a secret. And most forgot it. It is that. Or tonight it said that people are born wanting to figure out what life's about. And then they get distracted. But you're supposed to. It is only the ordinary mystics, which uh, here is one of the crossroads, one of the bi mental bifurcations, is the ordinary mystics always claim that man has made a misstep or that he has been misstepped on by life or fate or evil forces and that indeed as soon as they hear something about well originally man was so and so they didn't even have to hear the rest of the legend my little homemade legend that originally everyone knew a secret originally everyone looked life dead in the eye as soon as ordinary would be mystics here once everybody they go yep yep because they know what's coming their mind already can fill it in that once we were better off, and damn, boy, did we screw it up. See, and then, of course, they're safe. Because in the rest of their life, they can... The real serious ones, uh, one that I had many requests for the other night, had none, that said that uh, some people, some people without children will adopt a mystic. <laughs> Most of the serious would-be would be mystics, uh, a large percentage, if you will notice, go out and check your local mystical meeting somewhere. Even check the uh, dogma, the history of the more mystical sides of all the world's major religions. And you will find childish people. Oftentimes they carry it a bit further than explain it that <coughs> as the ordinary mind loves to do the internal tangle about is it causes, is it effect? Is it my heredity? Is it my environment? Is that me? Is that you? Who's that said that? They don't know which is which, but they even say, well, since this seems to happen naturally, what we should do if we're going to be a real mystic is don't have children. You don't have to tell them that. The would-be mystics, all you got to do is go check. I won't name names, but whoever the current, you go down to any good mystical meeting. If it has much of a history, it's probably you're dealing with at least middle-aged or older people. Unmarried, probably. Probably never married meeting in your local library, meeting somewhere. And if it's not that old, it will be younger people, but no children. I don't mean that that's what causes it, because if you accept that, then you'd be in the same boat as saying, well, I'm glad I chose to do that. 
Anybody that says they chose to do something, they do not understand what choice is about yet. <laughs> Put it to you bluntly, they hadn't chosen anything yet. <laughs> Life made them say it. Back to the would-be mystics. You can find your way out of the woods. Breadcrumbs? Follow. <laughs> you can get back. Here we go. <laughs> that everyone knew something. Everyone had a hunger. You didn't actually know something and then lose it because you had to go through the process. You had to join the parade or get stepped on. But the original interest, in a sense, was laid aside which is not the truth, that's not the way to describe it, but there's no way to describe it. It is also the most specific telling of it is reflected in all the tales, <coughs> mythical and religious, about how gods, and what a religion it was, the gods of the cosmic forces, put man in some position other than that in which he was created. In this part of the world, the great one, or the one, is Adam and Eve, that they were at one place, they were in paradise, the Garden of Eden, and ran amok. And the forces said, Jesus. <laughs> huh, figuratively speaking, I guess. He went, you know, Jeez, you, know, you guys get out of here. You know, go get a job, grow up, you, know, I, you gave you a chance. And everybody, even atheists, will nod along with that and go, God, you know, what a allegorical message. Because it strikes Everyone, Christian, Jew, atheist, agnostic, even attorneys probably. There's something in your nervous system, being as how it's tied into life's nervous system, to say the least, when you hear a reflection of reality and you're saying, uh, regardless of what you want to do, you feel the tingles. Inside you kind of go, oh. well, you do not jump up and holler, no! What insanity. It's not, if anything, you just you know, make sure not to say anything. Because you just know there's, no, you know there's nothing to be said to that. There's nothing to be added. But at any rate, everybody from Christian to atheist, from religious person, when they hear that man has run amok, but why? Well, if you've got any ability to think, if you have any ability to do anything, you do know that man has not run amok. He's not running amok. He is running anti-muck. He, he is running against the forces of muckiness. Not, you know, not that he knows what he's doing, but the main parade is just it's going right through muck fields, knocking over muck barricades. And <laughs> so man is not running a muck. He's run, he, he may be running muck or anti-a muck. But. And so what is it that makes people go... Of all stripes and beliefs and everything that makes everybody, as soon as they hear the stories, and you surely know it's not just Christianity. It's all the way into folk tales and uh, less civilized areas still on this planet that just have, uh, you know, local shamans or you say shaman, rich doctors, and they got some kind of tale. And it still be that, you know, men were originally, our forefathers lived in the trees. Maybe it's people living out in the forest now still, a fairly feral life. And they'll have stories that they take quite seriously. We're not making fun of it that our forefathers were born, created in the trees. And then you know, the great forces of the sky, or the plains, or the forest, says, whatever you do, do not ever kill a red bird. And then one guy thought, hmm, and he killed a red bird. <laughs> and the, father, the forces finally came along and saw a dead red bird and knew that only man could do it because only man was that high. And he threw him out of the trees and put him on the ground. And you see where that's got you from, you know. There they are. And you, hard ground, it's muddy. Well, you know how it goes. So, in other words, that's a curse. There's a story like that everywhere. Also, if you could think, if we want to take another quick sidestep, not that ordinary people are supposed to see this, but this is one of these examples that you could look at as life, having a sense of humor 364 days a year, not just April the 1st. How about that every story... Every religion, the father and mother of all myths of almost every culture is something about the gods telling man something other. Don't eat that fruit, don't kill a red bird, or the gods created man. So right, here you are and everything's fine, but don't do so and so. And every goddamn time, they do it. And you would think, wait a minute. I mean, this is just us talking. It's got nothing to do with religion. It has to do with the working of the human mind, the way the parade has to go. 
you would think that some intelligent person, perhaps even you, I don't know, you got a mirror at home somewhere, <laughs> that somebody go, well, why is it that everywhere on this planet, everywhere, every era, there is that same story that the gods created man and told him one thing, you know, said, you look fine, you know, I did a great job, and you know, live it up, you know, the place is yours. But it's here, Jupiter, Athens, wherever. And he said, oh yeah, one thing, don't do so and so. And he left, you know, hours, minutes, I don't know, they did it. The question is, what kind of gods does the mind conjure up? And you think, well wait, he created all this and then told the people don't do that. And every damn one of them did it. And you think, it didn't ever cross his mind? I mean, just even the possibility, they turned his back and left. Of course, you get really good using their definition. The ordinary, nobody in particular, but man's definition of the gods and cosmic creative forces, if they did that, it's self-evident, verbally, which is what, where God lives, the ordinary people, that he knew they were going to do it. If he created them, of course, that's the kind of thing that didn't have to say, my son, you're getting very close to being, what do they call it? We'll have to just bar you. Is that what they do? <laughs> Some Catholic will have to fill that in. <laughs> I know it's excommunicated, it's just that the religion is not that well known of attorneys at law that if you got a line, they won't let you in the bar anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably worse, I don't know, but it's probably worse than a Catholic being excommunicated. Yeah. But by their own definition, what I want you to see is you, you can't do anything with it. We're not trying to pick on religious people. It wouldn't prove anything. But to, for me to ask you the rhetorical question, do you not find it interesting that no one even seriously thinks about that? Mm -hmm. There's some religious apologist or the Pope or, you know, there's intellectual people in all religions that go, wait a minute. I've done some reading, anthropology, et cetera, et cetera. And every place on this planet, including our own religion, has a story about the gods created man and said everything, blah, 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 but don't do so and so. And every one of them did it. What kind of gods are we coming up with? They can't do it. For me to say if they can't and shouldn't, what would they do with that? What good would that do if the Pope, just using him as an example, or the head rabbi of a church, or whoever's running the Groover Syndrome group now. If you held him down and made him, and you told him that, and he went, you're right. What would you have accomplished? He would swell up and explode, at the very least. Well, take to drink, and probably hang around you and blame you, and you'd be stuck with his barbell the rest of his life. And some old religious people can get real tough and grisly and live a long time. And he's going to follow you around blaming you for it. So, Word to the wise. Back to where we were. There's another breadcrumb. And I see a footprint that looks like either hands or feet. Gretel. Ordinary minds, sane, ordinary people, your parents, everyone you know, the presidents, the popes, the prime ministers, everybody on this planet that is sane and ordinary, they do have a sensation. They will positively react if it does not sound as though it is a qualitative statement of some sort. If you say, well, everybody has a feeling that they're not doing exactly what they should, and it seems like somewhere they missed a step. And everybody goes, yeah. But they do not carry it any further, nor are they supposed to. It is only drugstore weekend mystics that say, wow, there's the proof. My God, come over here and join us. Sign up. You know, you should be doing better. They couldn't do any better than they are. And that's not a qualitative judgment. That is not a pejorative statement. They could not be doing better. So other than that, ordinary people will respond if it is put to them in the correct way. In the allegories of religious fact, of course we'll have to withdraw the allegory to them, if it's presented to them as a religious allegory, let's try that, or if it's presented to them as a, under the guise of a fairy tale, they will listen, and I don't mean just to pacify the teller, it does serve a certain kind of purpose, and that's why the nervous system will react with sane, ordinary people to hear stories, just Flip through Mother Goose, Grimm's fairy tales, legends, myths from anywhere, it doesn't matter. It's almost impossible once you see it to find a story if it survived for a generation or two from any culture, from any people anywhere, you'll hardly find a story in there. All right, if it survived, you won't find any story in there that does not have something to do with this. 
And so people do, it's sort of like a pacifier. It is sort of like uh, munchy comfort candy or something in the parade as you're marching along for the 60 or so years. As you hear stories like that, and it's not just in what would appear to be quasi or ostensible serious myths. It is literally in popular culture, in movies, just TV shows. You can see it everywhere. Anything that becomes popular has a mythical, if not mystical, core to it. And it certainly does not have to be, ha ha, stated. It does not have to be that the people writing knew it. But anything that survives, I don't care what, any kind of group of movies that keep showing up, and they do sequels, or a TV show that runs for any length of time. Uh, well, I should, since I brought it up myself recently. There is a kind of dumbing entertainment, you recall, I've been through that, that is simply a time out. It is a wishing that I was, that is the viewer, wishing that we were less civilized and we could back up the parade. But other than that, if it is not a kind of dumbing entertainment, just distraction, if it actually seems to be that people will watch the TV show or go to a movie or read a book and treat it in some way seriously, even if they just go, you know, that is, if they do it, no, and I'll go see that. That sort of thing. It's not just mindless distraction, so to speak, to use ordinary parlance. If there's anything to it at all, then there is a mystical slash mythical core to it that can be quite tacit, to say the least again. And it does not mean the writers know what they're doing because life's writing it anyway. They're just doing what life tells them to write. But that kind of information, that kind of, in a sense, pacification is there. And people do not get that too upset. And if, if worse comes to worse, they go to church. They take up a religion which seems to be, if you've never thought about it, is like the ultimate. Does everybody know the real t definition of ultimate? Uh, or a substitute. Take your choice, somewhere in that range. If uh, reading Superman comic books no longer seems to do the job. If watching kung fu movies no longer does the job. If seeing Clint Eastwood hero, seven swords of the samurai. If all that begins to wear off what I'm saying, which is what I was insinuating about popular culture, if it's not dumbing entertainment, it is in some way based upon the mythical telling that man is not complete and so don't give up hope yet. It is, if it's not dumbing, it is in a sense very low level because we're still running off fossil fuel, remember, the ordinary. Mm -hmm. But it is a low level of encouragement. And so I'm saying is people do get encouraged, if you never thought about it that way, of seeing uh, the Ninja Turtles or whatever, <laughs> or Clint Eastwood. That, the kind of thing where there seems to be some battle, as they normally call it between good and evil, but it seems to be that a man somewhere can transcend, transcend the kind of mundane circumstances. That a man can in some way, even if it's just the final two or three minutes out of a two hour movie, overcome the Philistines. And if a man gets, if that no longer feeds him, what I was saying is he can always go back to religion, which is sort of the less specific. I know it seems more specific to people, but it's less specific because it always says, well, you know, even if, even if our rituals and our movies, our books do not satisfy you now, wait till you die. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean, it's according to what kind of neural wavelength you're running on that, you know, from one view, you, as, as proved by this, sometimes you can laugh. I, we pull this out once or twice a year, I guess, by accident, just running along. But sometimes people laugh over here and some over here. So you can say, well, it's kind of funny, and then it's kind of not funny. But that's why I took the time out to say that religion is sort of the, a religion is a two-headed possibility. That it offers myths and legends not, to, not specific enough to turn people off or real specific. It's according to what you're looking for. Religion is normally the cache of the real ambiguous open-ended myths and legends. Even though it can seem otherwise according to how you want to look at it. That it can say, well, so-and-so was the son or daughter or first cousin of God and he was here at one time and he said these things, we wrote it down. He had a stenographer. He brought... God sent down his own the guy that had been through court you know, school and wrote it down. So we got his exact words. And you can say, well, hey, that doesn't come in more specific than that. But it does. And it comes less. That same thing. 
Because then you can go join up with this group or threaten to and then try and investigate the religion and say, well, uh, so he said, if you do so and so, then you will overcome your circumstances or you will become more conscious. Well, they call it things like being more spiritual or you'll become unified or you'll become closer connected to the forces that run the universe. And the head of the church, or whoever you're talking about, goes, yes, yes. And you say, well, has this happened to you? And you go, well, no. Well, do you know anybody? Is anybody here in this church that that's happened to? Well, no. Yeah. But wait a minute. You've got millions of people coming here, and they're all contributing and showing up and doing the ritual. Yes. But wait a minute. No offense, but, and you're saying that, as far as you know, no one's ever been able to do this. No one's ever experienced the payoff. Yeah. And, and if you're still, if you do not make it as an attack, because if you attack somebody, they're okay. But if you kept making it as like real interested, objective interest, then it gets to be the other side of real specific, the exemplar of non-specificity. Because they can say, well, you're asking a lot. Because even though I hear what you're asking me, that I can't do it, and I don't know who one has, but also look at the further promise. He said, well, wait till you die. And it's according to you know, what sort of mode you're in. But if you're in the right kind of mode, and I mean all of you have been and can be again, that is the ultimate, that is the supreme sales pitch. <laughs> Even though you can laugh at it from one eye and go, ah, oh, come on. Because if we brought that down to street level, it'd be like a car salesman they're on, you know, trying to sell you a, a car. And you said, well, does this thing actually do 200 miles an hour? However they advertise, and, and you're real interested, and you're right there. And he says, well, no, you know, don't do so-and-so. And so does it actually get 400 miles a gallon? Well, no, not actually. And maybe he says, uh, well, can I actually, is the price, is that actually half what it was originally? And you go, well, no. And then maybe you say, well, does, does it actually, does it even run? And he goes, well, you know, you've been so nice, and you seem so interested. I'm gonna no, it won't run. And then he says, but wait till, it, wait till you die. If you buy it now, no, wait till you die. And say, so that's not even funny. <laughs> I mean, you, but I want you to see, that is, but that is the same thing. We're not laughing at anybody else, unless you're looking in the mirror again, because you'll all get in the same mode, the human mind will, that, so that something can appear to be both specific, too spe very specific, and non-specific. <laughs> That they will say, All right, follow this teaching, or follow our religion, come to these rituals. And what you're saying is, or you, you approach them on the basis, can I regain, can I pick back up where I used to know the secret? And they'll say, well, right here it is. It says, you know, be ye as little children. Come to think about it, that's one of your great religions. Somebody hears. <laughs> yes, well, you come back into the glory of the gods, or you come back in their favor, and they will open up your heart and all that. And you go, whew. Well, how long did it take you to do it? And go, the priest or rabbi said, oh, well, no, wait a minute. I didn't, I didn't mean that I personally can do it. You said, well, who, 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 who here in the temple? Who in the church? Who can I talk to that's actually done it so I can get going? And he goes, well, uh, you know, since Moses or Jesus or Buddha, whoever they use, they go, so, well, you know, they told us about it. And then you go through what I've already done. And then you, again, if you're not using it as an aggressive tactic on the person, if you're not attacking them, which will give them their rat hole out, anybody's mind, because you can do that to you, of course. I know it's not as much fun. It's more fun to argue with somebody else. <laughs> Unless you know how to do it, by the way. So. <laughs> well, hey, once, once, you realize, once you realize the average intelligence of people, if you're going to argue with somebody, look at it that way. Why not a real challenge? I mean, since most people finally decide that they're the smartest bastard on the planet, you know, if you are, why go out there and waste your time with amateurs? A challenge. They will say, well, no, since, since Buddha, since our leader, since the person who gave us these specific instructions, these specific promises, you know, let the car will do 200 miles an hour, get 400 miles a gallon, since... You know, since then, nobody's been able to crank the car. <laughs> and so you can say, wait a minute, it was all real specific until I actually got down to it. But then it's just a quick step. It's like turning over a coin. And you, you think, God, I want head so bad. And you're looking at its tails and go, up. Oh. All it takes, it. I started to say sleight of hand, but it's not sleight of hand. All it takes is breathe. And you look and they've turned it over. So it went from being very specific. And you say, well, this is what I've been looking for. You know, how can I do it? When, when, how long will it take? And they go, well, nobody's done it. 
And you go, wait a minute. No. And they go, yeah. But think how that little beauty will run after you die. <laughs> you see, then it is so inspecific, but you can't laugh. Are you going to be laughing at yourself, your parents, the majority of the planet? <laughs> the majority, majority, majority of the planet. So we have people who do react, who will vibrate positively to any kind of notions, stories, ideas that man could be something else and that at one time he had the possibility and it may have been in your lifetime. Well, I can't blame that on them. That's my legends to you guys. Everybody else, it's somebody else's lifetime, which is another story because that makes it even less. So that's like it'll happen after you die to believe that you lost the way, you personally lost the way, made the wrong step, missed the boat via, as per, humanity having done it. Yeah. That is now you're out of the graces of the cosmos of God because of Adam. I mean, no, not that you're perfect either, but it wouldn't have mattered if you were perfect. If since you were a little, little tight that you had just been the, you know, you've never eaten from the forbidden tree, you've never killed a red bird, you've never done anything at all untoward. But boy, what chance we got? Adam already screwed it up. See, that's the, if you don't understand, down a line of time, that's the same thing as, well, no, I can't do it, says the priest, or says religion, but when you die, it's just the other view of, well, I can't seem to do what I want to, but hey, it's not my fault. I've tried hard. I know I'm not perfect. I'm not, it's not that I am blameless, but it would not have mattered were I perfect. Because look what they already, look what humanity has already done. All of the stories, what I was saying is all the sane people, which that's all we're talking about, sane ordinary people, they react in a positive way that in some way things have gone, if not awry, I have missed some possibility. You know, all this time I keep trying to scratch and I can't find the right place. I keep trying to expand my mind or I keep trying to figure out what life's about. I keep trying to have some sort of experience. Uh, I keep getting close. It, you know, the first time I got drunk, I did it. The first ten times I smoked pot and I took the mushrooms. One time I accidentally stayed up for three days. And one time uh, when my mother died, and I, just suddenly out of the midst of that kind of shocking funk, I remember the two days after the, she died. And people have these glimpses that I can almost feel it. Ordinary people, it just comes and goes. Those that would be mystical... Take it more seriously. But the point is, all ordinary sane people will react to it in various, in, well, they react in the same way. It appears to be in various ways because some people react to a l religious context, presentation of it. Others to a mythical. Uh, some nowadays with a psychological. People even react nowadays. Well, they always have, but people will react on the basis of a political presentation of saying, well, well how do you account for Marxism? Right quick. For one thing. Well, as in fact, for those of you who are getting real serious, you can account for Marxism the same way you can democracy, fascism, everything else. It's head wolf. <laughs> but other than that, you remember the story tonight? I noticed, well, one or two people seem to like it. They said on one planet, the forces that ran Earth, that life to keep people distracted, sent down a guy to talk to them, particularly the ones that might have potentially <coughs> caused trouble on the way. And talk to them about matters neural, not hormonal. Talk to them about mental matters, not physical matters. And it, and it worked because it was real neat because they all thought, all read you. They all thought, well, hey, that is the terminology of progress. Mm -hmm. That is the terminology of mysticism. <laughs> I don't think we converted anybody since the first telling, did we? <laughs> The people, ordinary people, positively react to stories and legends, but they have to be vague and inspecific enough, and they must have an out external source. But it must be vague and, and non-specific enough, so if it gets down to kinds of hands-on, 
possibilities, hands-on <laughs> interest, it's always, well, wait a minute, son, you know, you're going to have to wait until you die. It's either that or I know that you're interested in that, but you know, man has a curse on him. <laughs> Allegorical Adam messed it up for all of us. Two or three easy, obvious, point-blank things. The first is always being that man has not run amok. And if a person cannot see that, they'll never see anything else. And you can't be converted over to it. You can't be won over to it. And if you can, you're no better off because you still don't see anything. You've simply become... Mr. Happy Face. <laughs> or maybe now the spirit of Norman Vincent Peale has inhabited your shorts or something. <laughs> or for you women, Napoleon Hill has crawled into your brazier. <laughs> Until you can simply realize this has nothing to do with... By the way, I was going to say something since I brought it up. Marxism. And I was saying that besides the reality, that there is no such thing, or the reality of all political systems is the same reality if you don't know, if you never thought about it, of religion and everything else, it's simply a power struggle. So it's always been. Doesn't matter what you call it. It's always we're playing alpha wolf. Sometimes the church is on top and then the state's on top. Sometimes a prince wins and sometimes a pope wins. And sometimes the fascists win and then the next time the socialists take over. And then the socialists go out and the fascists come back. And the fascists go back out and some communists say, well, let's start a new one. We're communists. And they go, what's that? And they go, well, it's not your damn business, but we're in charge. We'll tell you later. Yeah. <laughs> that's what, well, that's what it all is. But I wanted to point out uh, when I was saying that the uh, mythical message, the mythical encouragement comes about in all matters, all the way from religion to political systems. Not the reality of it. But the Marxists, how do you explain that? that or anything, but the, the Marxist was another extension, which is always the wolves get behind everything. They get behind it and go, how can we take over? You know, but you can if you got enough wolves, or if you're the wolf and you're mean enough, you go take over, you're supposed to. Some wolves always in charge. But as things have become more sophisticated and we have become allegorically and really speaking more urbanized than wood-wise, jungle-wise, then if you notice, not entirely, by the way. Our news print and media is replete even today with people killing each other, except nowadays. I mean, we've got bloody warfare going on. We're talking here now circa May 1994. And in civilized countries all over the world, there's two or three examples right now just her, you know, shocking, bloodthirsty slaughters of people. But they have a political theory behind it. I always remember that. And you're supposed to, well, if, if you're ordinary, you do get distracted. The mind. As you go, well, wait a minute. Perhaps the such and such, you know, we don't approve of what they're doing. Now you sit outside the conflict. And you say, well, I certainly do not approve of taking those kind of drastic, draconian, bloodletting measures against the populace. But I've got to admit, knowing my history and knowing what happened after World War II and the balkanization of cutting up Europe into such and such piece and how this happened, they put a propped up guy. And now this party over here, the uh, new left-wing unhinged flange of the so-and-so <laughs> party, they, they say what they're doing is what they're doing is unforgivable. But but understand their theory when they explain when they've put forth the three you know, post-deconstructionist World War II balkanizations of our country addendum or proclamation. I can understand their theory behind why they do it. You understand? It's to get the mind distracted. There ain't no theory behind they do it. They won't charge. It's, a, it's a, somebody wanting to be the wolf. He can be dressed up in a funny hat and a dress and waving a cross or a star of David or he can have a gun. It's all the same thing. Or he can just go <laughs> Sad to say that the day are just going Rawr. It's kind of getting over. It's why, it's, why, it's why at one level crime is increasing individual crime because there's less chance 
an opportunity on a mass level just to go, uh, or for you to be drafted with a head wolf and go, uh. And so now part of that comes out of just individual crime that they find. If you really want to go off the subject and stay right on it, it's why there's supposedly, by their descriptions, why there's now more and more mindless violence. It's just people walk up and say, uh, give me all your money. And the person says, certainly. And they say, well, thank you and shoot him. And people go, there was no need for that. Well, sure there was. The guy wanted to shoot him. I said to you, what well, he gave him his money. Well, he didn't want just the money. He wanted to shoot him. That's right. He wanted to be in charge. He wanted to play wolf. And now there's is less and less urbanized opportunity. Of course, it just so happens to be using the term allegorically is just the opposite because it's considered urbanized crime. But it just shows everybody's got it backwards as always. <laughs> you have got to see that humanity, you've got to see it on your own without any description. There can't be a description of you mucked it up yourself, that you are now an individual mucker. <laughs> That life is not, that man is not run amok, he is not going backwards. Then you're left with, well, why, the, the hunger that I have, if you'll pardon me saying so, so aptly, so deftly described of how the human nervous system will vibrate quite positively all the way from religious myths to Greek myths to Ninja Turtle cartoons. That, yeah, if you understand for yourself that life, man has not run amok, Life is, man is not running a muck now, that life is not through man going downhill, then you're left with the individual possibility. It strips you. Nobody has to tell you anymore that if there is such a thing as some kind of great work that you have to do it yourself, this has to be in you or it doesn't exist. You can be out there in some great uh, building somewhere. You can be with a fine group of people. You can be doing all sorts of things. And yet if it's not in you, it doesn't exist. And that's nothing original. That's been said for thousands of years. And you can hear it go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But once you understand what I've just described, you are stripped of the need to even have it explained to you. You understand that I'm either doing it or it's not being done. You can suspect it's being done all sorts of places. You can suspect that whoever's writing up the Kung Fu movies, regardless of what I said, you can suspect, wait a minute. I bet that is some of the secret people that had to leave Tibet when they raised taxes or whatever happened. That reached an unpleasantness when they... Increase property values in a completely unacceptable manner. <laughs> you simply realize that no matter where you suspect it was going on, you could suspect forever. You could suspect and think, boy, I wish I'd been alive when Buddha was around. God, that'd have been great. Wouldn't have made a goddamn bit of difference. And once you're stripped of the illusion, once your own nervous system no longer is be distracted, by anything that man has run amok in the past and is now continuing to run amok, and that which I hunger for is out of my reach. Maybe it'll happen after I die, but it's certainly not possible now because of what's happened in the past. The future, to quote myself, thank you, is full of promise, the past with regret. It originally said, for those of you who like literary insides, it originally said, the future is full of promise, the past is chock full of regrets, but I was afraid that reminds some of you too much of Big Apple Coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Chock full of regret. Yeah. We could rename the parade Chock Full of Regret. <laughs> but remember, if you're not in the parade, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh, got it. It was a dialogue conversation. Well, every parade needs some clowns. <laughs> yeah, but this many? No. 